All right, guys, Kobe here with my reviews for this week. I'm going to start off with the Victories, number 11. Uh, a really great series all around, as I've been saying ever since I've been reading it. Uh, this starts the metahuman uh, story arc, which the last one's been transhuman, it was posthuman. Uh, so it's kind of keeping that, that um, theme going. Essentially, all the people in this world are kind of uh, being controlled by this drug called the float, which we've kind of delved into in the story a lot more. Um, then it turns out heroes are actually carriers of a disease that wipes out most of the world. But it turns out they actually weren't. It was all set up by like a secret organization to kind of make the bad guys get thrown into concentration camps. Blah, 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 blah. There's been just been so much going on in the story. All of it's nuts, just crazy. And in this particular issue, a lot of things have been going down. A lot of team members uh, have turned on the victories and just breaking points are reached and people just kind of lose it. And it's, it's essentially what would happen if Batman completely lost it. And it, it wasn't even Batman, but it's like a dude who's like Batman, but he actually does murder people. He doesn't, he doesn't have a, a code about it. So when it finally comes to the breaking point, he's already like going off kill. It's awesome. So good. Uh, one of my favorite series, they just got superheroes really, really down well in this book. So I'm going to give it five out of five nerd skulls and highly suggest you read this if you haven't been reading it already. I'm serious. Do it. Hey guys, Miles Morales Ultimate Spider-Man number one comes out this week, which is of course the pickup of Ultimate Spider-Man after Cataclysm. Uh, when uh, it was rumored that the Ultimate Universe was going to end, I was kind of terrified because Miles Morales as Ultimate Spider-Man is one of my favorite books, so I didn't want to I didn't want to see that end. Uh, thankfully, this new book starts up, uh, kind of has Miles as a looking at like a James Bond kind of figure, but uh, in this issue we see we see him pick up as he has a girlfriend now, but the what happened in Cataclysm still is still fresh on his mind. He told his father that he was, that he was Spider-Man, uh, and his father did not take it well at all. He blamed him for the death of his mother, and uh, it was just terrifying to watch. But in this issue, he keeps on stopping back at his apartment, and his father has not been seen since. So I want to see where that story goes. It's very uh, uh, disheartening to see that relationship kind of break because we have seen him and his father just get along for so long, uh, and just to see him totally blame his mother's death on him was just heartbreaking. But uh, Norman Osborn is back. That's a, a one big reveal in this issue. Uh, he did not die. And uh, because S.H.I.E.L.D. is over with, the government has to take him into custody. And without a better way of saying it, Hellfire breaks loose. Um, this book is just fantastic. In the last issue, it's ju it, it actually has a big reveal and I, that I didn't see coming. So uh, I'm, I'll leave that to you. I'm not going to spoil that for you. But it is uh, great artwork by David Marquez. Of course, Brian, my, by, I think it's pronounced Brian Michael Bendis writes it. Uh, so I, I love this book. So I'm going to give it four out of five nerd skulls. Hey, fellow nerds, Jasper here. And I just got done reading Batman Superman issue 10. This is a pretty cool story that Jeff Lemire wrote uh, in regards to Batman's completely unconscious after him and Superman pretty much come back from uh, a space mission. Uh, you don't know why he falls under this coma. Well, what you do get is uh, Superman asking aid from Dr. Palmer, as we all know, is uh, the Atom. Uh, pretty much, they have to do a, you know, honey, I shrunk the kids moment where they have to shrink down to size and go into Batman's uh, brain where they realize that there is a uh, alien city or planet, in a sense, uh, living on his brain. You don't necessarily know why, but you find out that, you know, in the grander scheme of everything, that there are uh, two aliens by the name of uh, Titan Super Gladiator and Dr. Sledgehammer, who pretty much hijacked the city and uh, you know put everyone under their control. So now Superman and Adam pretty much have to fight their way to save Batman. But what's more funny about the whole fact is uh, Titan Super Gladiator, long word, big name, finds a way to escape Batman's brain and pretty much finds himself uh, squaring off between Batman. And, you know, you would think that it's a difficult scenario, but, of course, even with aliens living on Batman's brain, he still finds a way to whip ass, and that's why I really did enjoy the issue. Under certain, you know, dire situations, he always pulls through. But uh, it's pretty cool due to the fact that, you know, this is the first introduction to the Atom in, you know, the 52s, in a sense. So definitely check it out. I'm giving it a four out of five nerd skulls. 
Hey there nerds, Jim here with my comic book reviews this week. And first up I have Terminator Salvation, the final battle number six of 12. Huge fan of Terminator. I love the franchise. I really enjoy what J. Michael Straczynski is doing with this storyline. I think it's fantastic. In this book, we basically reach the point where John Connor has no idea what will the, f the future will hold, which is very cool because it ties back to Terminator 2. No fate, but will we make our own? But the reason why he doesn't know, and this was something you just don't think about, but it became apparent. Kyle Reese goes back. He had a certain history up to a point, so he told Sarah what was going to happen. Sarah related to John. The T-800 comes back. That's in Terminator 2. He obviously relayed to Sarah and John what was going to happen. After that point, nobody came back. We don't know. We don't know. Which does lead me to another thing. If you're reading and watching this, please clue me in. I believe they're totally negating the Rise of the Machines movie because we don't have any references to Clara Dane's character and we don't have any references to the T-800 that kills John and then is sent back to Rise of the Machines to protect him. I, I, that's what I'm picking up on it, but let me know what you think. Anyway, back to this one. I really like how they focus on Thomas Parnell, the serial killer from the 80s that is brought back into the future. And he's still in control of the whole Terminator army, but now Skynet is realizing this might have been a mistake. And they had sort of put some limiters on him. He realized that, and now he's going berserk. And it's interesting because Skynet realized that although his methods are very efficient at killing humans, they're also killing a lot of Terminators running through them, and Skynet's not going to have enough Terminators to build more Terminators. So it's an interesting quandary, and they have to analyze, and it's interesting to see that a machine may have regrets. So is that the next level? I don't know. I highly recommend you check this book out. Dr. Kogan plays an interesting, integral part. I'm almost getting the sense that maybe she's not all bad in that she's not only just helping the Terminators. I'd like to get your point of view. There's no real spoiler there, just a little back and forth. Definitely check it out, five out of five Nerd Skulls. All right guys, so I also got to read Cyclops number one this week. I, I was really excited, confused, unsure of what the series was gonna entail, mainly because Corsair is supposed to be dead and that's straight up, he's dead. He died like six years ago like tragically in front of everyone and his own son, Scott Summers, his younger brother that this Scott Summers in the book still doesn't know about. Uh, it's it's kind of got a lot of really cool potential because um, I was just really wondering, I want to know where those twists and turns are going to come in because this first issue was pretty straightforward. This is the Star Jammers. This is what they do. Scott Summers' his dad doesn't know how to be a father, doesn't understand it yet so I feel weird about Corsair I feel like this is a different person a different version of that guy that we're used to um, it's it's kind of got me intrigued but the cool part about it is it's more uh, a story of how they come together or they're going to come together uh, they're it's setting up where it's just gonna be this uh, this awesome little series of awesome vacation time between dad and son that they haven't had or they're gonna have again like this version of Scott doesn't know his dad at all Boom, we're going to take a trip through the galaxy in this awesome two-seater ship, and it's going to be you and me forever, or at least for this issue, or for this run. But, yeah, I'm stoked. I'm actually really excited. The artwork was great, and the story was actually really, 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 really hit home. You know, it was really good. So, 5 out of 5 Nerd Skulls, Greg Rucka killed it, and uh, you guys should check it out. Hey guys, a new number one out of Boom Studios. They've been really surprising me lately. Uh, with The Woods number 1, James Tinney in the fourth, who we've actually interviewed a couple times, writes this book, and it, he really knows how to tell this story uh, about a school of kids uh, that gets transported to a moon on the other side of the galaxy. Uh, I mean, a whole bunch of stuff happens there. I mean, there's woods outside the school now, and I guess you can call them woods because we really don't know the habitat too well yet, but there are some kind of animals in, the, in those woods, and there's like this stone that's, being able to, that's able to talk to the main characters. Another thing I want to talk about is how the, those main characters are laid out in this book. Every single character that they, that they introduce kind of narrates it and moves the story along in a different way, giving us a hint as to their, back, their background. I like the way that was lay, laid out. Uh, the artwork is fantastic by uh, Michael Dialinus. Uh, it was just great. It was a great read, so I'm going to give it four out of five nerd skulls. Check it out. I just got done reading Detective Comics issue 31, and there is a murder afoot at Wayne Manor, and Bruce Wayne is the prime suspect. Harvey Bullock is coming down on him 
with the whole fact that Erica Aguilar has died in Wayne Manor through the Icarus drug. And at the same time, you have Bruce, or Batman in a sense, trying to find out uh, what's going on and how this even happened before Gotham PD you know, pretty much takes him down as Bruce Wayne, not necessarily Batman, because we all know that's not going to happen. Uh, it's pretty cool because you have Bruce you know, going through different personas, trying to inquire uh, all the different drugs, or at least the Icarus drug, through different uh, you know, street dealers and all this stuff, and they pretty much fight back due to the fact that he is getting pretty close to you know, this, their scene. But through the whole thing, the best part about it is the fight with Sumo. So you definitely have, should, should check it out. I'm giving it a three out of five out of five nerd skills. So I also got to read Archer and Armstrong number 20. Now, we've finished up most of the storylines we've had in the past. We have the sect war is over, the whole uh, uh, bloodshot, rising spirits over. We're all new and we have Archer and Armstrong going to Hollywood. And what I really like about Archer and Armstrong is Fred Van Lent's writing and his use of history, fictionalizing it into fantastic stories. In this book, we basically get a great piece of America uh, history in it opens with several famous deaths of musicians. And they're just frames each. So it's kind of cool to you know, be like, oh, that's who that is. That is, oh, I wonder who that is. And it's all the way, you know, I think it started way back in the 50s, all the way up to, I think the earliest one was 97. So it was really cool to, to see who was what and where was what. Um, but as the story goes on, you're like, well, maybe some of those aren't, musicians aren't dead. What are they alluding to? The reason why Archer and Armstrong are in Hollywood is Archer's looking for his birth mother. Um, this is back to Bloodshot giving over the details from Project Rising and all that stuff, Rising Spirit. And they're in Hollywood. They're visiting the retroologists, which personally I got was the Scientologist, but make up your own opinion. They enter the building. It's this weird, weird place, clearly Hollywood. Um, the main room building is the Famatorium, just screaming to me of that's what it is, Hollywood. And they run into the leader. They're split up at first. So Archer gets to meet the leader and he's quickly put in his place. All the psionic powers he has are useless. And it's interesting, they explain it away in a great way. The leader explains, you're going nowhere, you're not gonna meet your mom until you find, and this is what's great, because it takes us all the way back to the original story arc, the Wheel of Aton. And Archer already knows it doesn't exist, it's fake. But this guy believes it's in the building there. He knows where the real one is. It's really interesting. Basically, Archer and Armstrong get screwed, have to find this thing. They're in a maze in this weird place. And it's all because the leader is a lizard king. I'll let you figure that one out. Once you read it, you'll know. If you know anything about song, music history, you should know that one. I love how they incorporate that. I highly recommend you read this. Four out of five Nerd Skulls. All right, guys, it's gonna be here with my review of Future's End number one. Now, I was really, really stoked for this because the guys behind this book are some of the coolest writers of the last 10 years. Jeff Lemire, Brian Ozzarello. I mean, Brian Ozzarello's been killing it even before this. Uh, Keith, Keith Giffen is doing some of this and he's just a classic guy. He might not always have like the best crazy Jeff John level saga stories, but He's been around, he's made some amazing characters, done some amazing things, and in my opinion, he was probably the most important part of 52, besides, you know, Jeff Johns and Rucka and all these guys writing to Graham Morrison, you know, oh yeah, they're great writers, but he's the one that set it up and got the story from them and laid it out for everyone, which was, which is awesome. That's, that's a whole nother project and another way hard thing to do and kind of get a grasp of. So the fact that this guy can do it and it can handle it, it's awesome because he's, part of this story again and to get to the story it's actually pretty interesting if you've been following the DC universe it really doesn't match up to anything that's going on right now there's just kind of like hints of things that happened in the past things that have gone down people doing this and that and and you don't really know or at least I don't really know what the hell's going on which is awesome to me Batman Beyond comes back it's Terry McGinnis sorry if that's a spoiler but you should have known it's it's totally Terry McGinnis he's from the future and you have no idea why he can't go back to the future and he hasn't talked to anyone yet. And he has this AI system. It totally reminds me of like 
Jarvis, like the, the movie version of Jarvis and stuff, which is pretty sweet. Uh, it's called Alfred, of course, but either way, uh, it was really interesting. Uh, the Firestorm relationship is really interesting. Uh, just the kind of things that they're teasing to come along in the DC universe is really sweet. But being that this is the first issue, there's nothing to go off of. Like, there's a tragic death at the end. I'm pretty sure they've already talked about it all over online. I won't say it because I already spoiled something, and that's a dick move. But it's crazy, and it just sets up those questions that you want answered. So, you know, it's the it's a first issue of a 52-issue series. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully I get to read it next week. Uh, I'm going to fight for it probably because it's, it's pretty sweet. The artwork was great. Uh, I can't wait to see where it goes and where, uh, what we get from it. So it doesn't, I'm not going to say it's going to be better than 52 just yet, but it looks like it's going to be pretty damn awesome. So check it out, guys. Five out of five minutes, goals. Hey, guys. Alex Nada number six comes out this week. As you know, I love this title. Jonathan Luna always kicks ass uh, with the artwork on this. Sarah, uh, Sarah Vaughn is awesome. Uh, but this issue, I have to warn you, is kind of a filler issue. Not a lot happens, but there are a couple conversations that might be setting a precedent for what could happen later on in the series. Um, at one point, Alex does mention to Ada that she does not have to do every single thing that she's told, which is uh, very interesting. I want to see how a jailbroken, jailbroken android new to consciousness will actually take that, uh, that suggestion into light. Um, by the end of the issue, she steps outside, against Alex's suggestion to stay inside. Um, and, uh, and I won't tell you what results of, to her stepping outside, but I mean, it's not too, this, this, again, this issue, not a lot happens. So I'm gonna give it four out of five nerd skulls just because the book is so great. But uh, again, don't expect too much, check it out. So I got to read Real Heroes number two. Uh, the first issue when it started, this is Brian Hitch's book, both writing and art. I was like, okay, whatever, it's sort of been done. But then the, the last half of that book really got me, and now this one is even more so, where our heroes are in another dimension, they're learning more about what they are, is required of them, and what, that's what's funny, I said heroes, they're not heroes, they're actors. And in this other dimension, the heroes that they play on screen as the actors have all been wiped out. So they're all dead, so they're all kind of freaking out about that, because they don't want to have any part to do it. So the Olympians, as the actors, the old team that got killed are, um, are against Brainchild. And the idea is that they will just go on camera, impersonate these heroes, and try and convince Brainchild to a truce. Good idea, except it blows up in their face, as all things do. Nice little comedy at the end. I like how it breaks up the tension with that comedy. I really enjoyed this book more than I thought I would. I, would, I highly recommend you, you read this. It's a great superhero book that is dramatic and comedic. That's rare, rare to pull off. I really enjoy that. I'm gonna go ahead and give this one five out of five Nerd Skulls. All right guys, could be here with my review for Original Sin Numero Uno. Uh, I don't know where to start, truthfully, because it kind of went all over the place, this book did. Like, you think you're, you're in for something, you know, you read that zero issue, and all it really does is kind of get you to understand the Watcher, kind of get where he's coming from, understand his past, understand what he wants to do, what he's trying to do, and which, is, which was really tragic, really like, oh man, I hope you do it, man, but like you also know he's going to die, which is something they totally gave away, this is the whole point of the story, um, which was cool, which is actually really interesting uh, to start off with something like that. It, it's, it happens immediately. It, it sets it up and boom, it's done. And it's pretty much everyone trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, the team they set up for it is really cool. It's really eclectic group of dudes. Uh, mutants, humans, you know, Avengers, things like that. A lot of just random players, but I feel like they all have a meaning and a purpose for everything. They're all kind of like the top of their game. So that's kind of one thing that's kind of, ooh, I'm going to see, I want to see what's going on, but... It's Nick Fury's team because Nick Fury is back and taking charge of everything. It's so sweet. Love. I, I cannot wait to see what Jason Aaron does to Nick Fury. And I mean, if he kills him, cool. I don't mind. But I feel he's going to make him even more badass. And hopefully we can get rid of his son, who I don't like as Nick Fury because his name isn't even Nick Fury. It's, it's a movie play. It's so stupid to have another Nick Fury that's not his son. But whatever. Oh. I don't want to get too off track. But Original Sin, with artwork by Mike Diodato, I'm usually not a fan of, usually not too crazy about him, 
but his last couple runs on like Avengers, uh, I think it was New Avengers he's been doing, uh, those have been really, really interesting. Really dark, really gritty, uh, fitting along with those stories. And I feel like this is another perfect fit for his style and just the, the magic that is Jason Aaron writing is just perfect. So I'm really excited to see where this goes. Eight issues, hopefully it gets knocked out really, really quickly. And again, five out of five nerd skulls. Cause damn, that last page. <laughs>